Let's do it. This is how you Hey, this is how you Hey, keeping the faith in the king, and the patience will give us a free. So that's the same thing with sin, because sin leads to more sin. This is why the scripture says when you deal with sin, you shouldn't, you gotta flee from it like from the face of a serpent. You can't, you can't entertain even the, the, the smallest piece of it. Because you think you're not gonna be able to be succumb to it, but if you look at some of the greatest of our forefathers, if you look at our people historically, all right. The reason we continue to be in captivity and why we went in it to begin with is that even after the miracle of Passover, even after them witnessing the curses, witnessing, listen, it's as if the Israelites were here behind this table and the Egyptians were there and darkness was there but not here. Gross darkness was right there, right beyond the edge of this table but not here. When the, the angels passed by to kill the firstborn of everything. It wasn't just the firstborn of cows died. If you had a pet dog, the, the, if it was the firstborn, it, it, it died. Except for Israel. They didn't touch Israel. Right? We knew who we were, and we knew that we were a chosen people, yet we still went into captivity. So knowing what the end is, isn't really gonna help you much. You need to know how you're gonna make it to the end. Or rather, really, the beginning for us, all right? It's the end of this, the beginning. The scripture says Esau is the end, all right? Jacob is the beginning that followeth. I saw someone did a meme the other day. You know how they have the signs that say the end is near? It said the beginning is near. Mm -hmm. And that's how we need to be thinking. The beginning, the beginning is near, right? So it says a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. All right? It says your glorying is not good. Now, there were specific things going on here in Corinth that he was dealing with. Um, things with fornication and stuff like that. But all scripture is profitable even unto this day. And many of us, we're glorying in the Passover, how glorious it is, and the memorial of what it is. But we're still dealing, and I'm hearing things all over the body of sin. Right? Read on. Verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. Purge it out. When you purge something, it's not, you know, it's it's like a, a complete cleansing. It has to be a purging. Just like we got to purge Esau, there's going to be the remnant that hides in the caves and whatnot. And we got to come out. We got to catch every last one of them. We did the purging. It says purge out the old leaven. Your mind should be on that spiritual aspect of Passover. Purge out. The old leaven that ye may be a new lump. Right? When you read about baptism, it talks about uh, uh, the renewing, the regeneration of the spirits. These are all opportunities to think about that and, uh, and assess yourself. I, I, I've been thinking a lot about self examination, and when I was um, with some of the brothers um, in the leadership at uh, Atlanta. We were talking about how brothers don't know how to self-examine. And when I say brothers, that means sisters too, all right? Brothers and sisters don't know how to self-examine. And I told them, I said, I'm convinced self-examination is a spiritual gift. I, I really am, because it shouldn't be that hard to be able to look at yourself and fix it, especially when you have the mirror of the scriptures to tell you what's wrong, right? You can see you're not blind anymore, so you should know what's wrong. And that the more with yourself. When the scripture talks about he that is spiritual judge of all things, but uh, is not judged of himself, it means you have the spiritual gift of self-examination. And you shouldn't really have to have somebody show you that something's wrong with you if you're rooted in the application of this. Read the top of verse 7 again. Verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that he may be a beloved. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So he's telling you, Christ died for us, for us to be able to do that thing. His death is symbolic of that. That curse of all the firstborn dying, if you really think about it spiritually, that was the most highest firstborn. And while Israel was spared in Egypt... Christ's spirit was ordained to suffer that same affliction for us. 
Not so that we can continue to sin, but so that we could have that reflection of the scriptures, of the understanding of how we be able to have self-examination and to repent. Alright? To keep those laws. If you think about it, right after Passover, after being in Egypt so long, and I'm talking about the historical Passover, what was given to us? The law was given, not for the first time. We spent a long season in Egypt, the scripture tells you. And Joseph and Israel were forgotten. So we started to pick up customs of the Egyptians, much like today. And the confusion that we have, this is why there's confusion and judgment, right? The scripture's playing on how things should be, but we're confused because we're polluted by this present place. All right? Hold James. We're going to come back to this. Give me Leviticus 18 and 1. I want you to understand spiritually the Passover is symbolical. The law was given immediately after leaving Egypt. Spiritually, with the renewing of our spirits, this is the same mindset we should have whenever the feast comes around. It's all about renewal. It's the new year. It's the beginning of months, and we're keeping this feast during that time, all right? Because if you think about it then, he never really gave a reason for them to take the unleavened bread with them. When it told them, right, uh, well, there was never a, a, a reason for it. We get that understanding through the Spirit of Christ through Paul in what we're reading in the New Testament. So the law was given... Because we were corrupted by the Egyptians. Read Leviticus 18 and 1. This is the book of Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. So, this was a commandment. Moses spoke unto Israel, alright? It says, the Lord spake unto him. And this is why Moses was saying the things and teaching us the things that he was. He says, don't do after the Egyptians. And guess what? Don't go into Canaan and try to copy them either. But it was more than that. You can tell somebody not to do something, but then it's void. Because now there's nothing to fill in the space. Okay, so if I can't do this, what should I do? Read on. Verse 4. Ye shall do my judgments, and keep my ordinances, to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Go ahead. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes, and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. It says, if a man does these things, he shall live in them. Many of us have not come to that point where this is really our life. It has not really become your identity. Some of you are still treat it like what? I got to go to the Sabbath on Sunday. You treat it like when you were in the Christian church. And then in all your actions during the week, there's no self-examination. There's no defense for what besets you all around you. Everybody loves Psalms 23. Christians love Psalms 23. But you don't realize that when you walk out these doors, you're in that shadow of death, in the valley of the shadow of death. Because you're beset all around you by wickedness and evil, sometimes from the people closest to you. And how do you deal with that? You have to keep yourself rooted in the doing of these scriptures. All right? And Passover is very symbolic of that when it comes to the peace with the leaven. All right? So, go back to 1 Corinthians 5, start at 6. This is the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 6. Your glory is not good. So your glory alone, without the repentance piece, many of you speaking so proudly and exceedingly proud of how much you study, how much you watch class, all right? He says, it's not good, all right? Go ahead. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? He's saying you need to examine yourself because you're glorying, but yet you're still full of some leaven. All right, which is sin. Go ahead. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. This is what we constantly 
consistently what we must fight for. All right? This is the spiritual war that you read about in Galatians 5. This is an ongoing, you cannot get comfortable in this walk. I am telling you, you cannot. You got to understand that when you go out there, like this is the path that we walk. This is why I said you can't get comfortable. You can't get complacent in this walk. You should always be scared. Even, even if, if everything seems good and you seem right and you're checking things off, always be leery and weary because evil communication corrupts. It corrupts. How much is dependent on where you are in this and how much you're able to self-examine and dust it off, right? So it says, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, read. As ye are unleavened. Our goal is to be unleavened, go ahead. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Read on. Therefore, let us keep the feast. He says, therefore, based on what I'm telling you, let us keep the feast, brothers and sisters. How? Go ahead. Not with old leaven. Not with the old leaven of the things that I've said. Well, during the feast of Passover, I got to hear foolishness. I got to hear uh, uh, things about malice and strife in the body. All right. It says, don't keep the feast with old leaven. Go ahead. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. So not even with the old stuff that you're dealing with, but don't keep it with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Go ahead. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is what Passover should mean to us outside of the, the miracles that were done to free us from captivity. All right. Which was spiritual. But when I say spiritual now, I'm talking about the spirituality of this walk. All right. And this is why I say I, I, I've been trying to simmer with a class on, on how many of us are not yet spiritual and how many of us only have a portion of spirituality, some none. All right. So this, this would be a nice setup to eventually when I segue into that type of class. A lot of you don't realize the spirituality. The Bible is a spiritual book. Make no mistake about it. It is very literal, but it's not spiritual in the way that you've been conditioned to see spiritual. With spirits around and, you know, Lord of the Rings creatures and revelations. All right? It, it's, not, it's not like that. Okay? And many of us are still only in that physical stage of this walk. And you've yet to get yourself to that spiritual stage. This is why Christ was saying how he marveled, how he says, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And some of you, your faith, you, you let your faith waver for the smallest things, for the smallest trial. I lost a job. I'm not getting paid enough. You know, that's such trivial stuff. We always gonna have issues with that, always. So why be depressed and ill about money problems? Read verse 8 again. Verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. With the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Who got that recipe? Are we having that tonight when we break bread? The sincerity and truth bread? We should in the spirit. All right? We should all the time. Give me first, uh, first Corinthians. No, nope, I'm sorry. I want Second Corinthians thirteen and five. So give me the Second Corinthians thirteen and five. It's the book of Second Corinthians, chapter thirteen and verse five. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Examine yourselves. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I often use the the uh, uh, analogy of like when you leave your house. And you pat yourself down for your wallet, your car keys, whatever it is. Your, the, the, the essential things you always go with. The phone, right? You're looking for your things. That should be your spiritual check for that whole arm of God before you leave. You should be doing that daily and moment to moment. Examine yourself whether you really be in the faith. Go ahead. Prove your own selves. It says prove your own selves. That doesn't mean nobody else can prove you. Clearly, if you understand scriptures, you know that that's a process that we all must do. But it says, hey, not only do you have to prove others, you have to prove your own selves. Go ahead. No, know ye not your own selves? Don't you know your own self? You should know your own self. Hey, I got the answer to that. A lot of you don't. When it comes to certain sins that, you, that you've yet to overcome, a lot of you do not know your own self. Some of you is so bad. You can have 10 people telling you the same thing and you won't see it still. 
Hey, listen, I'm not always saying consensus is right, but when you're dealing in the spirit, how much more does it take? See, some people, they just need their heads chopped off. That two -third, that's why two-thirds have to die. Two-thirds must die for things to be fulfilled. There has to be a falling away for things to be fulfilled because some of you will never know your own selves. Read. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, <laughs> except ye be reprobate. Because that's really what it is. Many of you are reprobate. And you don't realize it. You are reprobate. You think that because you're keeping some of the basics of the law that you're okay. But you have to continue to overcome the things that beset you. You got that? Yeah. So you leave it. <laughs> Who knows what reprobate means? Because it's in the scripture. Void of understanding. Void of understanding. Void of understanding. Okay? So, captain always brings the scripture out. Psalms 111 and 10. Right? When the captain says, you are, you are reprobate, you're void of understanding. And you're void of understanding because, the first and foremost, you really don't fear the most high. Because that's the first prerequisite. Okay? To getting understanding of the scriptures and the law, statutes, and commandments. Right. And then the second is the good understanding comes by the keeping of the commandments. All right? That means, that means all of them. You got to work to keep all of them. Hey, I'm looking up the definition uh, of it, right? Uh, it says reprobate, a depraved, unprincipled, or wicked person. All right? Uh, this one is my favorite, so you can really understand. A person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation. And unless you can self-examine, why do you think he, re he mentions reprobate in this verse, in the same verse that he's talking about examining yourselves? Because um, if you do not ever acquire that spiritual gift, you are rejected by God and beyond the hope of salvation. And it may take a long time, right? Time and chance is given to all, some more than others. But you have to have that spiritual gift. To understand and discern where you fall short so that you can fix it, right? That's why he says uh, how that Jesus Christ is in you. Meaning the opportunity for you to fix what's wrong with you is ever there. Because we're not going to allow that little bit of leaven to mess up the whole lump that we're working towards here. Alright? We don't. Verse 6. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobate. Hey, understand that. All right? You should know that we're not. That's not the spirit that we should have. Go ahead. Verse 7. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Not that we should ap appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest. Though we be as reprobate. He said, now I pray to God that you should do no evil. Not that you should appear approved outwardly, all right? But that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. He's going into that internal struggle that we have. He says, we're not reprobates because Christ is in you, except you let that carnal natural man or woman overtake what's going on inside of you. All right, read on. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Because no matter what, the end was written from the beginning. So, whether you get it right or not, guess what? That was written. That was predetermined. All right? The truth is still going to happen. Remember when I gave the class and I spoke with the scripture says, Though you be, though ye not be faithful, when Christ returns, there will be those found faithful. Because he cannot return unless there's faithful. So, it's telling you, there will be those who will do what God requires. The question is whether you are one of them or not. Read. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Because you read when he talks about, uh, he asked the Lord to take his lustfulness away from him. He said, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is magnified in weakness. This is what he's saying. He goes, we're glad when we are weak and when ye are strong. We're glad when we see people overcome the things that you got to deal with. Would to God all of you would hurry the hell up and get your self-examination spirit in order. All right? That way the days could be shortened. Then you don't need other people to jump and correct you because you're self-correcting as you go. All right? So he says, we're glad 
when that happens. And you know why? Because we wish for your perfection. We, we, our, our sincere prayer is your perfection. This is why I'm glad when I see the weakness and then the strong come with it. When I see somebody move on from the things that beset them and they move forward to the next thing and the next thing to fix, it's a glorious thing because those are all signs that, hey, we get in there. All right? Read on. Verse 10. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness. Hey, Paul was no joke. Some of y'all are always offended. I've already gone over that in different classes recently. Paul was no joke. He said, hey, you fortunate that I'm writing this to you and I'm not there telling you this to your face because I will be blasting you with sharpness. Go ahead. According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. The sharpness is not to destroy the spiritual you, but to destroy your carnal you and then build you up. The edification, all right, and not to destruction is that. When you're rebuked sharply, you see, in the world, somebody rebukes you for something. A lot of times it's personal. Uh, uh, they want to they wanna steal your thunder and get the one up on you. That's not the case in here. The correction is for your edification. Read on. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be perfect. He's closing his letter. He says, be perfect. That's your goal, to be perfect. Not to say, I've come a long way and accept that you're still dealing with the things that you've not overcome. He said, be perfect. Go ahead. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Be of good comfort. Don't be stressed. Put off now the weak nature. Be of one mind. Stop being salty that you couldn't afford to go to Passover. All right? We didn't do that to you. You did that to yourself. Go ahead. Live in peace. Live in peace. Go ahead. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. If you do these things, the God of love and peace shall be with you. Christ is in you, except you be reprobate to these things that are brought out. All right? You know, another thing too, so I can show you that self-examination is spiritual. There's something that we're supposed to do every week where you're supposed to examine yourselves. <laughs> when we break bread. Give me 1 Corinthians 11, 27. That's why some people are offended that we don't want to give them bread. You don't understand what you mean. We saving your life. The book. This, this is why you can't force kids to break bread with grape juice. Well, I heard that thing in Passover too. I said, oh, why isn't this addressed? Hey, we got grape juice for those of you who make your kids. Do you know what you're putting on your children? When you read, you're going to understand what you're putting on your children who do not have spiritual discernment yet. You are their shield and buckler in this wall until they get to the age of understanding. Read. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He said, you are going to be as the Pharisees and the Romans that killed Christ if you partake of the breaking of bread unworthily. But what does he mean by unworthily? Read. But let a man examine himself. Oh, every week. Every time we come together. The weeks when we get together for the new moon. That's multiple times. All right? That you got to do that. So it's forcing yourself to put you in a position where you start to develop the mindset to examine yourself. When that prayer is going on, you should be thinking to yourself and reflecting. Are you worthy? Right? He says, let a man examine himself. Go ahead. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily shall be eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. If you drink and eat unworthily, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. Go ahead. Not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning that you're guilty of Christ's blood again. That it's like you're crucifying him again. Read. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Some of y'all are probably breaking and partaking unworthily, and then you wonder why you got things going on with you, all right? And when it says many sleep, it don't mean people overslept. It's talking about death. That's, that's how severe it can be for partaking of that unworthily. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's it I wanted on that. Give me James 1 and 19. The 
book of James, chapter 1 and verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You brothers and sisters are not like that. Many of you are not like that. You're not swift to hear. Somebody comes out and tells you something, and you want to start defending yourself right away instead of hearing and considering. And some of you who got your anger spirits get upset. It says you're supposed to be slow to wrath. Read. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Anger will prevent you from hearing anything. Anger does not make you rational. It does not make you lucid. Anger, in the context of the way we do it, is not spiritual. All right? Righteous, the understanding of righteous anger can only come if you understand what carnal anger is. So you can't pretend to understand righteous anger if you can't accept and realize that you're like, because isn't that the indication of somebody who's angry? They're not swift to hear, slow to speak. You can't reason or, or rationalize with somebody that's upset. And they're not listening to you. So uh, this is just one example in the context of what we're going through. I, I read this first because this was an issue that James was addressing. Okay? Which goes to show you, again, something very common amongst our people. Right? Doesn't mean it's right, but have comfort in knowing that others have overcome it. Read. Verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. It says, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, meaning the abundance of naughtiness, all right, letting it flow, okay, and receive with meekness the engrafted word. When you are being corrected, when somebody's telling you something, it says, lay all those things aside, be swift to hear and slow to speak, okay? Slow to wrath, lay all those things aside and receive what's being told to you with meekness because it's able to save your souls. I've said this before, you should be worried when people stop correcting you. And I mean knowing that there's something wrong with you because that means that they've left you unto Satan. And there's a scripture that talks about that when you leave them out there, throw them to the have them cast to the hands of Satan. Meaning, there's not going to be no more us trying to entreat for you. We're not going to we're not going to jump in front of you and try to dodge those spirits. Because if every scriptures come out, all right, for the same thing, and I'm talking about it's been in one year, two years, all right, and the same thing is still going on, you're the problem. And until you can get that spiritual discernment and receive things with meekness. Uh, uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, there's nothing that anybody can do for you. You're condemned to Satan because there's no more intercession that we can do for you. Be, go, be ye warmed and filled. <laughs> right? Those who know what scripture I'm talking about, it's like when it says faith without works is dead. It's like somebody, he says if somebody has, uh, needs clothes and food and you tell them go and be filled but you don't give them that stuff, did you help them? No. So you got people that are trying to clothe you, people that are trying to spiritually give you the, the, the cloak to defend you from stuff, and you're like, no, I don't want it, I don't need it. And then you're upset when you're out there alone with nothing to protect yourself. Spiritually, I'm speaking about. Read on. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. It says, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Too many of us are hearers and not doers. Read on. Deceiving your own selves. He says you deceive your own selves. All right? You're deceiving your own selves. How can you deceive yourself? A lot of times, some of you are like, no, I don't willfully sin. There's subtle ways that you do it. All right? Just like the example that he brought out. I'm going to give you an example that I brought out, I think, in the class that I did a couple weeks ago. Give me Psalms 139 and 23. I want 23 and 24. We don't do enough of this. This is one of my new favorite scriptures. New for me. One thirty-nine and twenty-three. Go ahead. This is the book of Psalms, chapter one thirty-nine and verse twenty-three. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You guys don't pray like that. 
You don't ask the Lord to search you and know your heart. You don't ask him to dig deep. If anything, you want him not to see. Especially those of you that are in the midst of sin. I went over secret sin in a two-part class. Y'all think that you're hiding things from, because you're hiding it from us, that you're absolved. Really, you don't want to know. Ignorance is bliss. It's like that scene in The Matrix with, with uh, Cypher. And he sells everybody out and he goes, you know, he's real chill. He's, he's eating, he's living it up. And he goes, listen, you're going to plug me back in. I don't want to remember nothing. Because once you're touched by this word and you fall away, you're never going to be the same. You're never going to be the same because you're always going to know that everything around you is a lie. You know what the end is. All right? And some of you might think you're okay with that until you feel that burning on your soul in that lake of fire. And then you're going to be like, damn, I wish I never knew. He said, I don't want to remember nothing. Contrary, the scripture says, search me, God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Read. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. You know, we don't do this and we don't ask it. Certainly not of God and even more so not of each other. When the scripture talks about that one counselor of a thousand, it should be, I mean, that you got to pick that. Nobody's going to pick that for you. Nobody can pick that for you. But you need to pick it according to knowledge because that's the person that you want to be able to ask this question and will tell you that. About, I, I used a joke, right? Like, you know, what type of friend are you if my breath stink and we going out and you going to tell me my breath stink, right? What type of friend are you if I got like a booger hanging from my nose and I'm about to go in a business meeting or something and you don't, you don't tell me that the booger's on my nose? You're a real good friend if you take it out without a tissue for me. Kidding. Kidding. No, you know how some people, they just look and they'll go and they're really, oh my God, I just touched it. But it's the same thing spiritually, all right? You want somebody that's going to be able to point these things out to you. That's going to tell you about yourself. You're not a good friend. If, if, you're, if you're, And you know that that person ain't right. And you want to tell them that they ain't right. There's something wrong with you. And guess what? Your blood, their blood is going to be on your hands. Alright? You think like, oh, I'm going to let them be in their mode and that's it. Okay? You have to, we don't do this, we don't ask this. And again, definitely not of God and certainly not of each other. All right? Get me, uh, let's go back to James 1 and let's read 23. The book of James, chapter 1 and verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So now, this is getting a little deep, right? So James is getting a little deep here. All right? He says, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, you got to start imagining this. He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Whenever you see the word natural, it's talking about your carnal self, your physical self. And the glass he's talking about is a mirror. So he's going into an analogy here where he says, if you're a hearer and not a doer, it's like you when you look into the mirror. right? Maybe before you leave the house in the morning, whatever, you give yourself one last look. right? Read on. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You don't remember what you look like without that glass in front of you, right? It would be very hard for you to describe yourself to somebody to draw you, okay? Yet we can give descriptions of others to other people. Why? Because out, it's showing you phys even physically inward reflection is difficult. He says, you look in the mirror and you walk away, and that's the end of it. This is how you can have the booger hanging on your nose and not know unless you look in the mirror again, right? Or whatever it might be. So, he's telling you that carnally, if you're living carnally, if there's no application of the law, you are going to be defenseless when you're out there if you don't have something that shows you about yourself, something that you can look back into that shows you where you're wrong, where you err, where you're right. Sisters, some of you maybe, right? I know, I know, I have seen it. Y'all, some of you can put on makeup without a mirror, right? But it's not your best face, right? Okay? A mirror is essential, right? I bet you if I ask any sister that wears makeup to go into their bag, each of you have a mirror. 
If any of you brothers have a mirror, you have a vain spirit and you're a narcissist. Right? I ain't got no mirror in my bag. But most sisters have a mirror, okay? They carry me. That's like an essential piece of thing with you. For me, I like to leave the house with my knife. Y'all, it's your mirror, all right? It's essential. That's your defense, okay? All right, give me chains of Joshua 1 and 8. We're going to come back to James. That's the mirror. The book of the law is that mirror for you spiritually. And you're going to see that James is going to back up what I'm, what I'm saying. All right, read on. That thou may, mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then you make your way prosperous. Because you're meditating on it. It shall not depart from you. All right? And we're talking about the application. Because nobody, all right, I don't care if you saw the book of Eli, the movie with Denzel, you're not going to memorize the whole Bible word for word. Okay? That's a movie. All right? Plus he was blind and there was nothing else to do. So that's why he was able to do that. All right? We have too many distractions now. So, <laughs> so it's only in the application that you have that. Hey, some of us can't even remember exactly where scripture is. We remember words, fractions of it. It's, hey, it says this and it says that. So the strength is not in knowing where it is or knowing what it says, but in doing what it says. Because that's better. It's like if I try to, um, like when I was in the Air Force, right? I worked, on, I worked on aircraft. And I read a whole bunch of books about it, right? A whole bunch of books. It wasn't until you actually did it that you understood what was going on. I don't care what diagram, even pictures. Until you get hands on with something, all right, the learning is not complete. You have to partake, all right? It is some people, you know, yeah, you might be able to read something, but you still have to take the action. Like there's some people, they could just read it and then they touch it and they're able to do it, all right? But the action still has to happen. It has to come to life. And all that hearing and not enough doing, it does you no good. Because if you read it and you stop practicing, eventually you're going to forget it, right? And then maybe it's there in your mind somewhere. Like they say, you never forget how to ride a bike. But if you haven't uh, rode a bike in a long time, you get on it, you're a little wobbly at first. You're not going to be as good when you first jump on it, all right? The application is where the learning is completed, and that's how you seal that in your mind. Is that it on verse 8? No. Go ahead. And then thou shalt have good success. And that's when you, then your ways will prosper, and then you will have good success in this walk, in this life. Go back to James 1, start at 23. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. All right, so it's like you're looking in the mirror. Go ahead. For he beholdeth himself. You check yourself, right? Oh, okay, the lipstick's not smudged, the eyeliner's there, the beard's, some of y'all, because some of y'all don't groom your beards either. The beard's looking good, the hair's neat, right? Some of y'all don't make your hair neat either, that's why I say some of y'all. All right, you check yourself out, you do all that, go ahead. And go in his way. And then you go about your day. And as the day goes on, if you don't look in that mirror again, you don't know what's going on. There's no self-reflection there. There's no way you can look at yourself. Right? I don't know. You try to move your eyes around. I can't see nothing on my face. Go ahead. And straightway forget what manner of man he was. You forget. Spirit, look at this spiritually. You forget what manner of man you are. Some of you forget that you're an Israelite man or woman and what you represent to those that are without. The example that we are and the light that we're to be to those that are in darkness. And you don't think that. You think that if you put on the show among the other believers, you're good. But you don't know. I mean, I'm telling you, with, with this growth, with this nation rising again, you don't understand how many times, sometimes some of us will be traveling and a random stranger will recognize you and either say something about it or you see the recognition. I've been places where somebody's looking at me and looking at me and I'm like, yo, why the hell the frick is, you know, the Bronx and me comes up, they're looking at me, you know? And I'm like, and they'll give me a shalom as I leave, right? Or, or, or whatever it might be. And I'm like, damn, people are watching. And we have to have that in our minds as an example, all right? That's what I'm telling you, there's honor in being called into this thing before the others. We're the example to endure and labor in Christ. Not everybody's teachers, not everybody's street teachers. Everybody has their role. 
Whatever it is that the scripture says, whatever it is you set your hands to do, do it mightily as unto the Lord. That's anything. From cleaning the toilets in the sanctuary to cooking the meals for the brothers and sisters, whatever it is. You should be doing that thing like in the spirit, like cleaning that toilet, like what? <laughs> joyful. Joyful to do those things. Is that it? Uh, read on. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Now, but whoso looketh, contrary wise to the natural man looking in the natural glass, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, okay, because the commandments are perfect, there's no faults in what the commandments teach us to do, go ahead. And continue it therein. And continue therein, go ahead. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. You are a forgetful hearer. He's telling you, if you are just a hearer, read verse 22 again really quick. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. The same way you can deceive yourself, you left in the morning with the makeup fresh, and if you don't look in that mirror again by 5 o'clock, some of y'all ain't looking too great, right? The makeup's run, the sweats come down, whatever it is, okay? Brothers, you know, maybe the, the snot's coming out your nose, whatever it might be, all right? You forget. You're not thinking about that. That's not in your mind. But he says the law is not like that. If you're applying the law, you constantly have a reminder of how you need to be and who you are. He says you look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. You're not a forgetful hearer, which is the problem, which is why you have people in this thing with the same problems coming up. You've never taken any action. You've never gotten the spiritual discernment to examine yourself. And you become a forgetful hearer. Because you know what you should be doing. You're just not doing it. And he says, but you're a doer of the work. Go ahead. This man shall be blessed in his deed. That person will be blessed in their deed. And it says man, but we know it's talking about man or woman. Hold this. Give me Romans 7 and 7. We're almost done. It's the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. That's the spiritual mirror. The law shows you what's sin. You don't know if your lipstick or eyeliner is smudged unless you got a mirror or somebody tells you. You don't know if you're in sin or not unless you have the law to show you what that is. And it comes with the application of it. Go ahead. For I have not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So he's giving you an example. I didn't know that I had a lustful spirit on me until the law said thou shalt not covet. Now, he didn't mention anything about fornication because lust can have many forms. I told you this. Lust is a form of covetousness. All right? You desire something. Some of you lust sexually. Some of you lust for material things. Some of you lust for attention, vanity. Some of you lust for recognition. It's still covetousness. You want to covet means to intensely desire something. All right? So he says, if it was not for the law being that spiritual mirror... All right? Then I would not know. Jump to verse 14. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. You cannot try to do things naturally in this walk. This is the spirituality of the scriptures that's missing. And many of you do not pray or seek for that. If you don't ask for it, only a certain portion is going to come on to you. If you don't work diligently to make it better, only a dispensation of it will be given unto you. All right? Give me 1 Corinthians 2 and... I don't know if I want 10 or 11. Hang on. Uh, yes, what about 10? The book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2 and verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. The Spirit has multiple meanings, but dealing with the Scriptures, it searches deep things. It says, uh, the, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
the commandments shows you. This is what this is uh, expounding on what Romans seven and seven is saying. All right, the Spirit, the law reveals because you know why it reveals you got a problem when the law comes out and you start doing this. You can't do it when you start twitching, right? You can't, no. When you get defensive, when a law comes out, it's revealing that that demon is on you. If I come to you with a scripture on anger and you get angry with me, guess what just happened? All right? It reveals, it searches all things. It's wonderful, it's a discerner. Last week I spoke about, the, it, the, it's a two-edged sword. Discerning, it's surgical. Read. For what man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of man which is in him. Carnally, you really know what's wrong with you, right? You know what your issues are. You know what your struggles. He says, what man knoweth those things? In a carnal sense, I might not be able to discern, to discern that. Go ahead. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. That's kind of going into where it says the Holy Spirit of discipline will fill the sea. Wisdom cannot reside in a malicious soul. He says... It says, the things of God knoweth no man. Read. But the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. So meaning, the things of God are His laws, the instructions, what He tells us to do. It doesn't become spiritual. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't mean anything. How many people know that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath? But if you never do it, you're never becoming spiritual. Many people in the world, the other nations, know some of the basic laws. Uh, uh, people that are, are, are Israelites or, or they say Jews they don't eat pork, they don't eat shrimp they know those things but the spiritualness comes from the application of it else, read now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God we've received the spirit which is of God and we know what we need to do but knowing is not enough Right? Remember that phrase going up? Knowing is half the battle? I don't know. It was like, was it G.I. Joe at the end of G.I. Joe? Knowing is half the battle. Hey, that's heavy. It was only half the battle. Because guess what? You still have to go to the battle. And you still got to deal with it. And you have to have the application. Read. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. We, we speak those things that the scripture shows us as well. Not carnally. Not in which man's wisdom teacheth, go ahead. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You cannot try to take worldly knowledge to look at these scriptures. You have to look at things spiritually. I've said before that a lot of the spirits we have on us, they have names. And sometimes you got to call them out. You want to ask for forgiveness of sins, but you're a prideful brother or sister. And you're going to say, Lord, take the spirit of pride off of me. That's acknowledgement that you got something on. Lord, take the spirit of vanity off of me. Take the spirit of anger. Take the spirit of physical lust off of me. Take the spirit of, of strife and divisions off of me. Bring up in me the spirit of unity, of one accord, of being on one mind. We don't name those things specifically. Read. But the natural man... Receive it not the things of the Spirit of God. Because it's like you're looking in the natural glass and you forget. A natural man or woman will not receive those things. And just like Captain brought out one of my favorite scriptures, Psalms 111 and 10. The good understanding comes from doing the commandments. And that's how you'll be able to receive the things that are of the Spirit of God. Wisdom will not dwell in a malicious soul. Read for they are foolishness unto him. It's foolish unto them. Go ahead. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This is why I say, self-examination is a spiritual gift. If you are having trouble accepting something that you're off in, multiple people see it in you, multiple people show, uh, you know, see something going on with you, and you can't see it, then you need to start praying, like in Psalms 139, for the Lord to reveal that to you. You need to pray for the spiritual gift of self-examination. Because you do not have it yet. Read. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. 
yet he himself is judged of no man. This is what I was talking about earlier at the beginning of the class. Because if you're spiritual, you'll be able to see the unspiritual things. And when it says you're judged of no man, meaning no one carnal can judge you whether you're right or wrong. I'll give you one example. People in the world look at us like we're crazy for the things we do and keep. They are not spiritual, so they cannot discern that. They cannot judge us. They're judging us on the measure of what the world expects you to be. All right? And it's the same thing with brothers and sisters in here who are not yet spiritual. They might not see nothing. Well, this is why it's very important that the counselor you pick is somebody who you've proven to know has some spiritual discernment. I don't need yes men. The Lord doesn't need yes men, right? He needs compliance to his orders, but he needs people that are gonna stand up for him. And standing up for him means what? Sometimes you're gonna offend somebody. Sometimes you're gonna, it's gonna come off uh, with sharp words. Sometimes somebody might go away. And it's all necessary. If the correction drives them away and they don't come back and they don't repent of it, then all praises. If there's a falling away, then all praises. Because remember, we read earlier, we can't do nothing against the truth but for it. Every action and everything we do, no matter what, is going to take us to that end result. Right? It's like a board game. You got to get to the end, right? On that thing. There's different ways that you're going to get there, but at the end of the day, then you're still going to wind up there at some point. Get uh, James 1 and 23 again. I want to go 23 through 25. And then I got one more scripture after that and we'll be done. It's the book of James, chapter 1 and verse... You want to start at 23? Yep, start at 23. Verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straight and straightway forget what manner of man he was. The scripture tells us how not to be, brothers and sisters. And it's the application of the law that will differentiate you from this person that's a hearer and not a doer versus what we're going to read next. Read. But whoso looketh in, into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer. He's telling you that if you're just a hearer, you're going to forget how you should be and you forget who you are. Okay. But a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. He shall be blessed in his deed. Let me go back to the beginning, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. The book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Don't be glorying. I've been here this many years, that many years. I've repented this way, that way. There's still so much more to go. Your glorying is not good. Always remember that a little leaven, leaven if the whole lump. Go ahead. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. Then and purge it out, that you may be a new lump. You don't want none of that residue of that old man or woman in there. Go ahead. As ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Because Christ was sacrificed for that very purpose. So that we have a chance to repent of him and move and to repent and move forward. Repent of all our sins. Alright? Because remember, under the sacrificial law, so many of us would be dead. Alright? Christ's sacrifice allows us to continue to do this right here. Read on. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Keep the Passover, brothers and sisters, this way. Not with old leaven. Be conscious and mindful of that stuff. Go ahead. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right. Uh, I pray that y'all get some understanding with that. Um, I wanted to try to keep it concise so it doesn't get cut off. I don't like doing the two-parters. And that y'all pray for the spiritual gift of self-discernment, of self-examination. All right. Um, it's essential. So that we are not reprobate. It's essential for us in this walk. All right? With that, I say shalom. Shalom, Israel. I'm Elder Nathaniel, Israel United in Christ. 
YouTube likes to shut our channels down, as some of you have noticed, <laughs> ever so often. Subscribing to join IUIC will assure you will always stay connected to our YouTube accounts. We want to do our best to make sure this truth gets up. Please click and join our subscriber YouTube channel called Join IUIC to stay linked to all of our videos. So again, please make sure you subscribe to this Join IUIC channel to get your latest updates on all our YouTube channels. Shalom.